Season 7's 7th episode of Marvel's Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. aired last night, and I, ever the fan of the show, am here to break it all down, so I hope you'll join me after the intro. Well, hello there! My name is Jeremy, and welcome back to Freeform Disney, where I talk about all aspects of Disney, from the animated movies to the theme parks to Star Wars, Marvel, and Pixar, and the TV shows, and everything else in between. And that is why it's Freeform. And keep coming back every day for new daily content. If you're not subscribed yet, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We're watching the newest season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and it's time to talk about Episode 7, The Halfway Point, and this one is known as The Totally Excellent Adventures of Mac and the D. And as the name might suggest, this one does not take itself seriously. This episode is essentially Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., well, Mac and D anyway, doing a giant parody of 80s movies. I'm going to break it down into the comedy, the heart, and the plot in that order and talk about it. So let's jump right on in. So the comedy. The comedy is what this episode is all about and parody and references now even the music is certainly a real big reference to the 80s we have all these robots in here because sybil comes back and she has this war games reference to this computer nerd with a little will you help me i mean it's not shall we play a game but that's the reference we're going for kind of the weird science piece and building them then the robots well, we get all kinds of different robot references from 80s movies after that, or 80s TV shows too, for that matter, I should say. So first off, we've got the whole short circuit reference, which is even explicitly stated when Mac calls one of them short circuit. They have this exterminate line, so we got the Daleks. And then there's also like this Battlestar Galactica Knight Rider reference with the red light going back and forth. And <laughs> oh yeah, and they said the robots are... Just a whole ton of 80s references all within themselves right there. And jumping off elsewhere, we'll go ahead and go with Deke for a moment. Now, Deke, well, he doesn't always catch his own references sometimes, so hey, that'll help the band if they've been drinking Coke like Cricket has over there. Well, yeah, maybe not drinking it. Now, speaking of Deke's band and Cricket, well, they are literally doing 80s songs. This is Deke, so it shouldn't surprise you a ton that he's ripping off the future to go ahead and put something into the past. In this case, only by a few years. The big one that we get to hear is Don't You Forget About Me. And that's the big 80s song that we get to hear out of Deke. You get to hear a good bit of it right there. But it's certainly not the only song his band does. And what, they're three years ahead, two years ahead of Breakfast Club at that point? So not even that far ahead. I guess enough that you can go sue them and get a settlement for a whole bunch of money for them stealing your song, right? <laughs> uh, anyway. Then we have this big A-team introduction to his band members because guess what? They're actually his agents that he's recruited. And essentially each of those different agents are this archetype of different 80s characters from movies and such. Then we move over to the lighthouse, and it's references galore again. We've got the hot tub sitting out there. We've got all these crazy lights in there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And hey, guess who's back? It's Coulson, but this time kind of as doing a Max Headroom thing on the TV. Even has got some of those glitches going on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, don't think too deeply about how this is working, but if you don't, hey, it works really well. It's fun, right? And who is watching the show and doesn't love Mac and his, his shotgun axe? Well, guess what? Mac's shotgun axe is back. And new and improved version, for that matter. And then Mac gets to make all of these one-liners during the course of it. Somewhere, somehow, someone's gonna pay. Looks like more metal for the scrap heap. <laughs> yeah, 80s one-liners for ya. What else? Oh, there's a Top Gun reference with the whole sunglasses look and j just the whole style of it. It had to be Top Gun. There's a Predator handshake in there. Oh, and we can't not talk about all the 80s horror movie slash slasher film reference that the end portion of this became. 
So we've got this part where Cricket and whoever are in the bed and they're just talking and they're setting up kind of your typical oh, pre horror they're going to die kind of moment. And that was exactly what that was. And the insane amounts of blood that spewed on the screen from that very, very 80s. And then we had the one robot with the super slow saw. Although, really quick hand grabbing, whatever felt the need. And, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, the cheesiness and campiness of 80s movies sometimes, right? It certainly went and nailed some of that. For better and for worse. <laughs> oh. I also swear the way the bomb exploded under that one robot just felt super 80s to me as well right there. Heck, we even had the whole laser thing coming from our civil robot or... One of the robots that will build, I should say. And then it hits Deacon. Well, hey, that's not even the worst rash I've had this year. <laughs> sure, that's how it works. <laughs> oh, but if we're making these kind of references, yeah, yeah, I suppose it is. And there are probably a hundred other little references and jokes I didn't catch during the episode. There were just so many references filling it. One other joke, though, for you. Or a bit of humor, I guess. And this was between Deke and Mac. Which is where Deke uh, tried out a new name for Mac that just didn't quite go over. The whole, thanks, Mac Daddy? Nope. Roger that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good luck. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, this episode, the whole thing was just intentionally overloaded with dorkiness and cheese and references galore all throughout the place. And hey, as far as that... Certainly I laughed during it, no doubt about that. But it wasn't all that. There was also a good bit of heart in the episode as well. Certainly not compared to the humor in the episode, but maybe a fifth. Anywho, so we start off with Mac in that big depression from the end of the last episode, after essentially having had to kill someone who looked like his mother, and, well, his father for that matter too, but in the case of his mother, pushing her out of an airplane. Yeah, again, that will kind of do it for you. And the fact that his parents are dead. Ugh. So he ends up staying in an apartment and shutting Deke out for a year or more, just completely down and about. And it was nice to see that it really did have an effect on him. We did get to see him with the model cars, and there was some nice stuff involving that. And it was also definitely nice to see Yo-Yo when she came back and reunited with Mac. They had a nice moment right there. So that was also really nice. Can I say nice enough times in one sentence? Nice, 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 nice. <laughs> uh, now on the flip side of all of that is good old Deke over there. Because Deke, during this whole episode, Deke's always been the one with a giant heart. Probably more so than any of our other agents that she'll we've ever had. He just is got so big a heart and cares so much about everyone else as much as he might not fit in and as much as he might do mm, some questionable things and deke's really been getting his own here in this season it's been a great season seven for deke and this episode was no exception it was a super deke focused episode and so we certainly get all the deke mac interplay and at the end we find out that deke had actually been looking out for reuben and alfie for anyone who's not clear on that alfie being mac when he's younger 10 in the case of what time period we are right now. And he's been looking out for them the whole time, helping bring them money and whatnot, as they're being taken care of by their uncle, it seems. And yeah, I mean, that whole piece was definitely nice. And we've got one other interesting piece. If you caught some of the changed lyrics in Don't You Forget About Me, you'll notice that Deke was actually singing it to Daisy, apparently. Because he had changed the line in there, so it was Daisy, Don't You Forget About Me. Just an interesting little piece. So there certainly was some heart to this episode. Now the plot? No, this is where the episode is really, really weak. So the episode started out with May having an intro with Deke and kind of gave us this framing device that said, hey, this whole thing is just going to be Deke telling us a story and hey, it's going to be this tall tale that you won't believe me anyway when I say it. And that probably would have worked well enough to explain why this made no sense in reality. Except, I think they kind of dropped the ball on it. Because this should have ended as just being that. Except, we bring in our agents near the end of the episode, good old May and Yo-Yo, and they meet up with our people in the lighthouse. So, May meets up with TV Coulson, 
And then Yo-Yo meets up with Mac and the other agents. So that means that it all kind of did happen. And I think that was a horrendous misstep right there. I mean, if you wanted to have the meetup reunion, I'm all for it. But we shouldn't have done it with everybody else in the background. Because that at least could have explained that, hey, this is what really happened. And further, we never quite got that conclusion to the whole May Deke piece. We started it and then didn't finish it. One of the things we could have done was maybe near the end, we go back to May and Deke and they're talking a little more and then we pan the camera to the right and hey, guess what? Max sitting over there next to Deke. And Max like, yeah, that isn't even close to what happened. Or some way that Mac would say that that's a little more accurate. But you get the point. That would have gone ahead and closed it off and said, hey, weird little pieces like Coulson on a hard drive, all that kind of stuff and the crazy robot attack. Well, this didn't really happen like that. This is just Deke embellishing. But instead, we kind of confirmed it at the end. So, yeah, it's a weird mess if you want to go into the plot and the believability of the episode. So speaking of the whole Coulson on a hard drive, let's think about that for a second. So Coulson blows up the Chronicom ship in 1976. And apparently both Coulson and Sybil make it out. On a hard drive? Okay. And apparently they have some kind of tech that could actually even interact with a hard drive back in 1976 or much later. So who discovered the hard drive in the lighthouse? I, I, you just don't want to think too much about this. Because it's 1982 when the episode, and 1983 because a bit of time goes by. Again, best not to think about how the heck this all worked. So what else did we find out as far as plot's concerned? Well, 20 months passed by for good old Deke and Mac, so I guess they're now 20 months older relative to the rest of the team. And we also found out the time stream that Sybil reads is a physical object, which she was able to succeed in getting back with her little robots and then slowly, 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 slowly took it all the way out over to her new compatriot, good old Nathaniel Malik. Remember how I made the comment, if you don't see the body, they're probably still alive. Well, yeah. And Nathaniel Malik is certainly still alive. And that means, assuming he still has the quake powers, which I've got to assume he does, that means he's now had another seven years to get used to those powers. We're definitely looking for a quake versus quake battle coming up. That could be interesting. I can definitely see a lot more going there, but we'll see what happens. Hard to say yet. Okay, while there were certainly a whole host of fun things and references in this episode, I think it was also easily the weakest episode of the season. It just felt out of place in the final season, an episode which was essentially a filler. Even if yes, it addressed the aftermath from the last episode for Mac, and yes, we got an extension of Coulson and Sybil, but that could have been addressed elsewhere and I think made more sense. I would have had far less problem with this episode having happened, say, in the first three seasons where there were more episodes overall and not the compact arcs that we've had for a while. And also here in the final season, it just feels like every moment we have is precious, and I want to get as much of it as we can out of those. So instead, dumping almost all of our agents out of the episode and giving us a parody just didn't work super well for me. Even if I certainly did laugh along the way, don't think I didn't. So I guess I've got a bit of a love-hate relationship with this episode. Well, here's hoping for a return to form for next week. And hey, it's that time, so what about you? How many 80s references did you catch which I missed? Because I'm sure there are some out there. And did you love this episode or wish we had gotten something more traditional, shall we say? Let me know down below in the comments. And thanks for watching. If you liked the video, please give it a like, share it with anyone you think will too, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done it already. I'll see you back here tomorrow for another new episode of Freeform Disney. Have a magical day, and may the Force be with you. Always.